Good evening. Did you all have a good day? Yeah, a little bit damp, but uh, you know. Uh, this is the um, SS Alpina, which is named after the port we're in today. It's actually the oldest ship on the Great Lakes. Um, it still has a steam engine. It's been laid up a couple of times. It's, it's been shortened, but there she is. She's very beloved amongst all the uh, all the people from Michigan, and uh, it's. Uh, uh, she sailed actually from here yesterday, and she carries cement uh, around the Great Lakes. Uh, she's in Green Bay, I think, tomorrow, and then she goes to Cleveland, and she goes up to Duluth. And uh, but she's uh, the most beloved vessel, and I'll be telling you about the uh, biggest vessel on the Great Lakes when I do my talk on the Edmund Fitzgerald and the Sioux Locks. So, but I just thought you might like to see her. Very, very, very popular ship. How many of you weren't here for my lecture on the first evening? Okay, then we have to, uh, those of you who were here, forgive me. We have to uh, put them through the training class on Michigan. Oh, okay, hold up your right hand. Okay, turn it towards you. Now hold up your left hand. Squeeze your fingers together. Okay, now turn your right hand back and put your hand on top and you'll have Michigan. Okay, you'll never forget it. You've got to squeeze, squinch your fingers together. Put your thumb up, madam. There is a thumb, put your thumb. There you go, that's it. You see up there, that's a the, that's the thumb. That's just west, uh, west of Marquette. And of course, um, right now, We're sailing out of here, and uh, that's how it really looks, and we're sailing actually right into the main shipping channels that go down to the Great Lakes uh, um, through uh, Detroit. I, in fact, on the uh, river in Detroit tomorrow, you'll see uh, maybe a couple of the uh, thousand footers that come by. A lot of them just start up in Duluth and go down to Gary, Indiana, around uh, Lake Michigan, but of course, we're going to be ending up in Detroit around lunchtime tomorrow. Uh, but remember, if you are from this part, you are a youper. And if you're from this part, you're a troll. And if you're neither of those, you're fudgy because you bought fudge on Mackinac Island yesterday. <laughs> All right. Um, the interesting shift that happened uh, was in the mid-1800s, the East Coast was where most of the industry was. Once the automobile industry started, the shift came to the Great Lakes. And uh, it became known as the Rust Belt. You know, Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Toledo and Detroit and there was, a, there was a tremendous uh, rise in the population here during the early part of the uh, 1900s because the jobs were here, and we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about that. So uh, that's the Rust Belt, and it's a kind of uh, it actually reminds me of um, of where I was born. A lot of people asking, you know. Uh, who are you, how did you get a job on ships, and uh, what's your background? I was actually born in the black country in England in a town called Wolverhampton. It's about 110 miles north of London. You come to the second largest city, it's Birmingham, and then about 20 miles northwest of there is, the, uh, is Wolverhampton, and it's in the heart of the black country. The reason they called it the black country as at the start of the Industrial Revolution in the early 1800s in England, they actually built the factories where the coal was. And of course, all that coal was burned, you know, to uh, supply the industrial places. And um, what happened is during the winter months, especially October, November, they have an inversion level and the uh, 
the, all the black soot that went up into the clouds then came down. And people would actually go out into the, they call them pea supers, you've heard of that word, right? They used to go out into the, uh, into the uh, pea supers and breathe in coal dust and get black lung disease. And it wasn't until 1956 that the British finally uh, uh, passed the Clean Air Act and, uh, and that, that, that's where I started. I actually started, uh, I worked in a factory with my dad and my two brothers. Uh, I had a degree in engineering and I was building aircraft engines. And uh, we were working on a project and Harold Wilson uh, canceled the project and laid off 80,000 men across, uh, across uh, men and women across the entire um, uh, country. And uh, my dad got a stay because he had longevity. My brother had an apprenticeship, but I was uh, out on the street and I thought, well, what shall I do now? And I went off and I joined the Royal Air Force because I think, I thought, well, maybe I'll fly around the world. Well, after one year in the Royal Air Force, I discovered that I had a clogged lung. So they took that out about 60 years ago. And so I've been pumping along on one engine since then. And I thought, what shall I do now? Well, I happened to get a job on a cruise ship. Uh, but I had to fly to New York uh, the, to join the QE2. And... Um, I get nervous when I fly. I don't know about you, but I do, especially because I used to build the aircraft engines. Um, <laughs> and, and back in those days, we were flying on one of those new uh, jumbo jets, the 740, 747s, right. And I always thought, thought they were marked down from 750, you know, so. But anyway, we were flying across the Atlantic at 30,000 feet on an aircraft made up of two million parts put together by the lowest bidder. I get nervous when I fly. <laughs> sure enough, the pilot came down to the PA system and said, ladies and gentlemen, this plane is too heavy. Someone will have to jump off and we'll all be saved. So straight away up jumped this English guy and he said, God save the queen. <sighs> and he threw himself out. Pilot says, what a brave chap, but we're still too heavy. A French guy stood up and said, vive la France. He went too. The pilot says, if one more goes, we'll all be saved. So straight up, straight away up jumped this big Texan uh, with a big, uh, you know, cowboy hat. And he said, God bless America. And threw off another Englishman. <laughs> but despite that, I arrived anyway. So that's uh, that's a little bit of my story like I said uh, most of them are true um, <laughs> tomorrow okay we're gonna go to the beautiful town of Detroit which is north of Canada well, who could ever have figured that out and we're gonna uh, uh, we're gonna see some wonderful sights but tonight uh, I'm gonna tell you about uh, a couple of things I'm gonna start off uh, with uh, Prohibition. Uh, Prohibition started in uh, 1920. It lasted for almost 14 years. Uh, and the manufacture and sale and transportation of intoxicating liquor were made illegal. And that was the time when speakeasies, glamour, and gangsters kind of took over the United States, at least uh, uh, in the major cities. Um, so, um, actually, uh, to uh, commemorate the, the, um, the uh, uh, prohibition, I'll be telling you about a, a special thing that's coming up here shortly. Anyway, um, at the turn of the century, the uh, ladies had... Uh, uh, of the United States had got fed up with the gentlemen who came home from the war, the Civil War, and they started drinking. And so they started this movement called the Temperance Movement. And as you can see, these lucky ladies said, lips that touch liquor shall never touch ours. And, uh, and they were the ones, uh, the driving force of this, uh, of this uh, act. Um, 
uh, they first they pushed moderation, that didn't work, uh, and so they they uh, they actually forced them to prohibit uh, liquor. So what happened was, at the beginning, uh, the uh, in 1919. The 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution prohibited the sale and manufacture uh, of alcohol, and it went into effect on January the 16th of 1920, beginning an area, uh, beginning a uh, an era known as prohibition. And uh, it was called the Volstead Act. Um, it stated that beer, wine, or other intoxicating malt or liquors meant any beverage more than 0.5% alcohol by volume was prohibited. And it also stated that owning any item designed to manufacture alcohol, like the stills, was illegal. And uh, they set up a, a bunch of fines and... Uh, and, uh, and uh, imprisonment if you uh, violated it. Um, but some people uh, had a way of getting around it. But by the way, the last week <laughs> before uh, uh, the uh, act took place, 141 million bottles of wine were sold in the, uh, in the weeks before Prohibition. Uh, but there were some entrepreneurs out there because um, if you, uh, <laughs> you could actually kind of circumvent the, uh, the act. Uh, there was a bootlegger by the name of George Remus. He was a lawyer. And then he just became a bootlegger because he started to make so much money. And he bought up 14 distilleries in Cincinnati. And by 1924, had earned an estimated $50 million selling illegal booze. Um, uh, but it was supposedly for medicinal purposes because you could go to your local priest or your local rabbi and get a bottle under the counter, you know. So <laughs> uh, it didn't work very well. But eventually, uh, um, undercover agents finally exposed him and he got uh, three years in prison. Uh, but for the people who didn't buy uh, uh, alcohol, they used these gentlemen to get around it and they would uh, also, uh, what happened was, this is when the gangsters took over because they figured, this is a, you know, the way there's a void, we'll fill it, and that's what they did. We'll talk about them in a little while. Uh, during this period, uh, they hired a bunch of prohibition agents uh, responsible for raiding speakeasies and finding stills, arresting gangsters. But most of them were underqualified, didn't know what the heck they were doing. And uh, most of the time, they got paid off by bribes. So it wasn't a very successful system. Meanwhile, north of the border, Canada said, come on up here. <laughs> come on up here. It's our happy. It's the best place in the world. And so they started to run these ads for you to come across the border uh, to Canada because liquor was still legal north of the border. And these are some cartoons from that era. And you can see it's, uh, there's some uh, 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 drunks up in the top left there. But, uh, and everybody says, this is how we enter. We're thirsty and we leave drunk. So that's, uh, uh, the Canadians had a sense of humor. A. Uh, <laughs> Okay, this is also the time of the Roaring Twenties. Is that for me? Did you bring me a cookie? <laughs> Go sit down, okay. All right. Um, but what happened was there was, a, there was this shift from extreme prosperity to adversity, and so that's where, when the uh, organized crime stopped, uh, uh, stepped in. It was popularly known as the Mafia, and its birth was in Prohibition. Uh, someone had to quench the thirst of the masses because uh, the jazz age was just beginning, and uh, flapper uh, girls became popular, 10 cents a dance. 
um, and uh, it was a very uh, open time. And uh, for the first time in history, more people lived in the cities than on farms. Women got the right to vote, and the wealth of the nation between 1920 and 1930 doubled. Uh, jazz, jazz bands played in club clubs across big cities, and the consumers wanted to drink. So they opened the uh, speakeasies. And actually, the Charleston swept across the country, and uh, booze cruises floated aimlessly into uh, you know, um, international waters. Kind of like this one, but um, no. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, who remembers dancing? Who, who remembers mom, their mom dancing the Charleston? Yeah. Um, uh, the, the prohibition needed a dance. Charleston fit the bill. It actually has its roots in um, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, where the uh, slaves, the African American culture, um, danced a dance called the Juba. And it originated with uh, the Congo slaves, and they uh, they the ones who did it. And usually at this, uh, this point, we have uh, five ladies that are in the second row. They're going to come up here and dance the... <laughs> we didn't rehearse. And they don't allow it any more liability because my knees... <laughs> yeah, I've had a, a few people come up and said, my knees will never do this anymore. And remember when they used to do the, uh, the thing? Uh, the, well, there you have it. Um, but it was a wonderful dance. There's Fred and Ginger. And weren't they spectacular during their day? Did anybody here dance at Charleston? It then became the Lindy Hop. Remember the Lindy Hop? It, it kind of trans transpired uh, and uh, made a, 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 a became the Lindy Hop in the twenties and thirties. But in the in the thirties, but in the twenties, it was a big rage. Um, here's what happened: these guys just took over, organized crime. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, eight notorious ones, Scarface, Al Capone, we know, Bugsy Siegel, Pretty Boy Flyed. We've all seen the movies lately uh, that have come out about these, Frank Costello, Machine Gun Kelly, and uh, John Dillinger, all public enemies, number one. And uh, what happened is these guys were thugs, but they became uh, businessmen because they... Uh, they were the thug men of the political buses, but they, they saw an opportunity and they grasped it. And uh, they protected the illegal breweries. They opened the uh, speakeasies and the demand for alcohol just was kept on coming. And um, so it turns the henchmen into mobsters and the rackets into businesses and empires, which you see uh, uh, in... Uh, in the modern era of, uh, of America in that era. Um, Lucky Luciano, he's one. Uh, he was from Sicily. He began, began working as a, uh, uh, a gambling boss for uh, Arnold Rothstein, and then he took over and, uh, and formed his own gang. Let's see. Is Anybody recognize this one? My kind of town, Chicago is. Right in the corner My of, kind of town, Chicago bottom left-hand corner of the Lake Michigan is Chicago. My kind and uh, Frank Sinatra is kind of town because he was known to be of uh, certain friends. I'm going to skip that because take that music off. It's hurting my ears. Um, Here's a guy you might recognize, Desi Arnaz. What does he have to do with the prohibition? Well, Desi Arnaz came to Miami. He was an illegal Cuban boy, and he went to school with the son of Al Capone. And, uh, and then Desi became a big star, and then he formed uh, with Lucy, of course. Uh, and that's my favorite one, the Chocolate Factory. But... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, that's a classic. Um, 
But he had a, he had formed a company uh, called Desilu Productions, and they produced a show called The Untouchables. And uh, Al Capone saw the show, and he didn't like it. So it's reportedly put out that, uh, that he put out a hit on, De, uh, on uh, Desi Arnaz. And this was <laughs> a hit man by the name of Jimmy the Weasel, who was supposedly the trigger man, but didn't complete the job. And this was confirmed by Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik. <clears throat> the only reason I like this, is I like to put these names in there, but has anyone here ever dined in a greasy spoon? Yeah, you know, and you see a guy with a, a trilby at the end, anyway. I love those old gangster names, you know, Cadillac Frank, Ice Pick Willie, Tommy the Toupee, Sammy the Bull, Grisano, uh, Gravano, Joey the Clown, Lombardo, uh, Carmen the Snake and Joey Bananas, the list goes on and on. Uh, and actually, I know we have a few English people here and they'll back me up on this. If you ever go to England, it's best to avoid the notorious fortnight tea at all cost because it's too weak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to throw that in. Fortnight is too weak. So, uh, I just threw it in there. You can boo that joke. Three, two, one. No, I didn't like it myself. I'll throw it out next time. Anyway, um, uh, so I met a couple of these guys who, uh, who starred in these movies. The most obnoxious man I ever met was uh, Broderick Crawford. I was on the QE2 in 1971. We were taking a cruise with Count Basie down to... Um, uh, down to the Caribbean, and half of Harlem came on board, but Broderick Crawford was on board. He was just a very rude man. Uh, uh, if you've ever been to a world championship fight in Vegas, uh, you know, especially the heavyweight fights, and you see all those gangsters come around, and all those uh, people who are dressed elaborately, that's what it was like when these people came on from Harlem in, in the middle of winter in New York. It was very, very, very um, amusing, actually, but it was interesting, too. So let's move on from uh, Desi and Lucy and the Hitman, because uh, there was a show called, uh, is there anybody who didn't see The Untouchables? Uh, that, that was a popular TV series from 1959 to 63. And, uh, of course, um, the uh, historians claim that, uh, you know, there's lots of bodies and liquor at the bottom of the, in the middle of the Detroit River right where we'll be passing under tomorrow. Um, some famous names. Let's see if you uh, recognize. Who's that? Louis, remember Nurse Ratchet? She just passed away recently, 80 years old. How about this guy? He had his start. Robert Redford. Of course, you all, everybody remembers Peter Falk. Do you remember the guy who narrated Good Morning, uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. America and All Ships at Sea? Walter? Yeah. And of course... Believe it or not, Captain Steubing uh, got his start on The Untouchables. Lots of, uh, lots of uh, Americana. I could tell you, you know, uh, stories, but I know you've, you've seen a lot of the uh, different, uh, different stars who've played, uh, who've played, uh, there's been 17 different characters play Al Capone. And of course, they were. Fam it was famous. He was famous for the St. Valentine's Day massacre on Valentine's Day in 1929. Two cops and two plainclothes guys walked into a garage in uh, Lincoln Park, Chicago, and they lined up uh, the these gentlemen against the wall. Seven Irish uh, gang members, and they just mowed them down. And then. People came running, and the cops got behind the two guys, uh, and the two guys walked out with their hands up, and nobody ever discovered who they were. Uh, but it was uh, 
Bugsy Moran and Al Capone were having a war, and um, that was why the Vas Valentine's Day massacre. Now I'm going to test your memory again, because I'm going to take you back to the 30s. Who remembers these great actors? Top left, Edward G. Robinson. Bogart, that joy, Henry Bogart. Did you, uh, did anybody see the uh, Easy Rider one, uh, the bike at, um, yeah, when they, uh, when they made a song about don't Bogart that joint, it was named after him. Who remembers this guy? Oh, sorry. Who remembers the third guy? George Raft, yeah. And of course, who could forget Yankee Doodle Dandy, James Cagney. And this classic scene, Marlon Brando, I could have been a contender. You put the money on Wilson. And uh, remember the actors? Ernest Borgnine and Marlon Brando. And of course, uh, I had the opportunity to meet um, Kirk Douglas. He was, uh, he was in his 90s, but he was still sprite. And uh, he and, uh, of course, Kirk and the... Uh, and uh, the next guy, yeah. And the last guy I actually had a chance to meet, does anybody recognize him? John Carradine. John Carradine. I had the opportunity to meet him on the uh, Queen Mary and he was in his later years. He had four great sons who also became actors, but he was in his later years. And you know, he has uh, 351 movie and TV credits. He was that great of a character actor. And he was a wonderful, a humble gentleman, and uh, and we shared uh, some time there on the Queen Mary. He was making a movie called, um, I think it's still on, uh, you can pick it up somewhere. It's called Goliath the Waits, about a ship that sinks and people who lived on the ship at the bottom of the ocean. That was uh, before Titanic. <laughs> okay. And that, of course, the whole... Um, era of gangsters begat this um, wonderful um, era of movies. Of course, uh, uh, you've got the untouchables right there. And then, of course, you've got all these different uh, wonderful actors uh, here, you know, who have starred in different, the Godfather, of course. The untouchables started it all. And this guy is Elliot Ness. And he was the guy who was the leader of the Untouchables. And he actually, uh, you know, after he left the FBI, he, uh, he moved to Cleveland, Ohio. And Cleveland and Detroit kind of have, uh, have a connection. Um, but uh, he actually cleaned up, uh, I think he went to the police department there. He, he threw out 200 corrupt cops, and uh, he was a very, very interesting gentleman. He's buried there in, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. He almost died broke, but he wrote a book called The Untouchables, and that kind of uh, kept him going. And then, of course, once, uh, once Mr. Copley came out with this movie, it became uh, a, a whole general with uh, Marlon Brando as the godfather. And that led to the Goodfellas, and that created all these. And uh, there you have my, uh, my, cousin, my cousin, Denzel. No, it's Russell. But he's not my cousin. His grandfather and my grandfather are related in some way. But his grandfather moved to Australia. And uh, so there's lots of great, uh, wonderful movies. Uh, we can talk about Prohibition. The interesting thing is, in Upper Michigan, they had had um, prohibition since 1917, and they never went drunk. They never went dry. Um, the uh, Grand Hotel that you might have visited yesterday had three speakeasies and also had a casino. And there was one lady who wrote a, a complaint sheet. She said that illegal boot bootleg liquor flowed more freely than the hot water at the Grand Hotel. That was uh, one of the complaints that uh, Bob uh, Taggart's told me anyway. So, 
And what a wonderful place. Sault Ste. Marie and Detroit, Michigan. I think they, they figure between these two places, because there's only a mile or less across the uh, water, they became the hotbeds of uh, supplying liquor to the United States. And uh, Sault Ste. Marie, I'll be talking about the Sioux Locks uh, in a couple of days, but um, it's just, a, uh, just a, 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 a less than a mile across there. And in the winter when it freezes, uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures here in a second, uh, it, it became the hotbed. They, they figured that uh, this was before the bridges were built, that 75% of all the illegal liquor that came in the United States came across uh, between Detroit and Sault Ste. Marie. And you've got Sarnia up there. Uh, and I'll be talking about some bridges tomorrow morning. And so we'll cover that. OK. Um, but everybody kind of got tired of it. The, uh, it wasn't working. It didn't work. So um, unfortunately, in 1929, the stock market crashed and everything else crashed. And uh, people needed a drink after the, after the stock. You need a drink after watching the stock market this year. But anyway, um, so we've talked a lot about the 18th Amendment. Does anyone remember, remember what the 19th Amendment was? Women's. Women got to vote, yes. Yes. Um, so uh, they got, sorry? Wisconsin. To ratify. To ratify. You know why I like Wisconsin? When I was in Milwaukee, if you buy a, a, a shot of whiskey, they give you a beer on the side for free. <laughs> you know, it's called a beer and a bump, I guess. I don't know what it, But, uh, you know, I, ever since then, I, I kind of, I go to Wisconsin now, and I say, oh, I'll have a shot of whiskey, please, Irish whiskey. And they give you a beer, you know, so. Anyway. Let's hear it for Wisconsin being the first state. Yay! And ladies getting the vote. Yay! Let's hear it from all the alcoholics. Oh, okay, let's not go there. All right. Um, what, that, what also happened during uh, this time, of course, America became armed again. <laughs> uh, and as you can see, it has. Uh, Hoover, and uh, they came out with this uh, gun. You can see Winston Churchill up there. Uh, he liked the Tommy gun, but it wasn't named after the British Tommy. It was named after somebody who invented it. And of course, he was a bit of a notorious drinker himself. Uh, one time, you know, he was uh, drunk in the, um, in the House of Parliament in the bar at the back there. And uh, Lady Astor came by and she said, so Winston, you're drunk. And he looked at her through his bleary eyes and he said, you're right, madam. I am drunk, but you're ugly. <laughs> and tomorrow I'll be sober. And you'll still be ugly. <laughs> she said, Sir Winston, you're such a horrible man. If you were my husband, I would poison your tea. He said, madam, if I were your husband, I should drink it. <laughs> anyway, that's enough about Winston. Um, because we're going to tell you about, a little bit more about Detroit. Uh, finally, it ended. Um, after 13 years, America was too thirsty. And the 20th of uh, February, the Blaine Act, also known as the 21st Amendment, uh, Roosevelt signed the bill. And uh, it was cheers uh, to who needs a beer. Anyway, um, but this is, uh, uh, this is what happened during, uh, in Detroit. Uh, they had actually, uh, if the ice was, uh, was too thin, sometimes they rolled in there and they're, they're still there at the bottom of the ocean. But they, they had spotters with binoculars to find out when the police were there. And if it was 30 below, they were obviously inside. Um, So the Roaring Twenties, uh, flappers, uh, jazz clubs, uh, 
um, speakeasies, the rise of the mafia, and women's rights uh, got the right to vote. Actually, um, they are preparing a drink uh, in the bar this evening f to celebrate it all. Uh, it's the drink of the day. I think that's what is special. It's a combination of, um, of Canadian 100% proof rum and prune juice. It's called a rum runner. Um, <laughs> boo. Three, two, one. That's a crap joke. Come on. <laughs> it's called a rum runner. It'll keep you going. But anyway, uh, this is uh, this is where what the real rum runners look like, and up there, of course, is the drink of the day. All right, so let's uh, move into uh, modern day Chicago, because um, modern day Detroit. <laughs> yes. Um, Let's talk about these gentlemen first, because in the middle of the, uh, and the, the late 18th century, the, they had uh, several men who were considered robber barons, um, but they are also the men that built America. They built the industry. Carnegie, uh, who was born in Scotland, ran US Steel. And like I said, the steel industry became secondary to the automobile industry. Uh, John D. Rockefeller, uh, he formed Standard Oil in Cleveland. Uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, he built the railroads. Um, J.P. Morgan was at the heart of the banking and finance and steel and railroads. He had his finger in every pie. And then, of course, one of the world's brilliant inventors, Thomas Edison, who was a, um, a great friend of Henry Ford, um, he invented the ticker tape, phonograph, the light bulb, and even designed a battery for a self-starter on the Model T uh, in 1912. And that uh, system was actually used for about a half a century, believe it or not. Uh, that's how brilliant a man he was. Of course, he had his own uh, fight with Tesla, but that's a story for another day. Um, but what Henry did was he revolutionized the industry. Uh, he set up the mass production line, and the new uh, technique decreased the amount of time it took to build the car from 12 hours to two and a half. This in turn lowered the cost of the Model T from $850 in 1908, and in 1926 you could buy them for 300 in town. And they were building and building. And uh, they had a much improved model. Uh, and he also introduced $5 a day, uh, $5 a day wage for eight hours, uh, which uh, was more than double that everybody was making. And he wanted to keep the uh, workers loyal to his company. But he ruled his, um, he ruled his uh, company with an iron fist. He hated the unions. You can't go into Detroit without talking about Motown. Barry Gordy Jr. Uh, he founded Motown Records in 1959. And you can still go to that same little house there on the top left-hand corner uh, today if you're not doing anything. Um, and of course, you had all these great people, Aretha, The Supreme, Stevie Wonder, Ronettes, uh, Bob Seger. Believe it or not, Eminem, <laughs> uh, Four Tops, Temptations, and Marvin Gaye, many others. And believe it or not, it's also home to the world's oldest ginger ale. Does anybody know what it is? Vernon's. Vernon's is the oldest ginger ale. And if you mix it with the bootleg liquor, it tastes pretty good. Uh, so that was the uh, Roaring Twenties. And um, you can't talk about uh, it, um, the uh, Detroit without talking about being the heart and soul of the United States automotive industry. And there are some cars uh, that, uh, that no longer exist, but let me throw out a few. Uh, who had a Ford Mustang? Anybody? OK. How about uh, Dodge, Viper, Buick, Cadillacs? OK. Uh, Chrysler, Chevy, Camaros, 
And, you know, there are so many, and, you know, the Edsel was uh, one. I saw one of those actually down in Cuba, and I was sailing down to Cuba about three years ago. So they, you can still find all the 50s classics down there in Cuba. They're still running, but not with the original engines. Um, so in 1913, um, that's when he, um, Henry invented the, the uh, moving assembly line. Now let's fast forward. The warranties run out. What happened is the, in the 70s, there was an oil crisis. And it, actually in 2013, Detroit sadly declared bankruptcy. After all that great wealth, it all kind of dissipated. Um, I gotta talk about Cleveland a little bit because you're gonna see a few of these cars if you're going to the museum tomorrow. These were um, cars that were made in Cleveland. And the reason I bring Cleveland into this is Ford didn't like the unions. And it was the United Auto Workers Union that, uh, and, the, uh, and all these unions started to unionize post-war. And finally, it was Ed Sol who was chairman of the board uh, who find they were the last company to allow the unions in. And uh, Edsel negotiated it, he put it in front of Henry, and he refused to sign it. But the writing was on the wall. It happened anyway, and the whole uh, car industry became unionized. And if you've ever been to Cleveland, uh, the uh, river caught fire twice because it was polluted, but that's another aside. Um, if you're going to the museum tomorrow, um, you're gonna uh, have a wonderful, wonderful time. You're only there a short time, and uh, you're gonna wanna come back and visit there or Greenfield Village, because uh, uh, history here. The latest exhibit is the um, villains of, uh, and heroes of Disney. Um, if you, uh, how many are going to the Henry Ford Museum? If you want a great experience, take 15 minutes and going to, um, especially if you're petrol head, going to this driven to win. It's like a Disney experience. And for 15 minutes, they put you behind a, uh, a Formula One car, you know, the Indy 500 motorbike. It actually gave me goosebumps when I sat in there. Take the 15 minutes when you, after you've had the uh, Dawson tour to go Make that a priority. You, you, won't, you won't miss it. You can also dine at a 1946 diner, have a, uh, a root beer shake. Remember having those back in the day, sitting on the, hauling up to the round seats? Uh, how much? For five cents. For five cents. <laughs> okay. I think they charge a little bit more than that there now. But, uh, of course, they have... Um, they actually outbid uh, the Smithsonian for, um, for Lincoln's chair. And, uh, you know, when he was assassinated by Booth, and three days earlier, Booth said, uh, Lincoln had given a speech, he says, that's the last speech you'll give. And then, of course, he shot him in the back of the head, he died in the chair, and you can actually see the chair right there. Let's talk about, uh, uh, for me, um, the Ford Museum is Americana at its best. But in 1955, in a town called Money, Mississippi, a 14-year-old black boy named Emmett Tillots was murdered and lynched by two members of the Ku Klux Klan. And one of the many uh, people um, who saw the casket, it, his mother decided to have an open casket because she wanted, she wanted to show the brutality of how badly he was beaten. And uh, there was a young lady who was a secretary for the NAACP in Montgomery, Alabama. Her name was Rosa Parks. And four months later, she was sitting on a bus marked for colored people. She was asked to move for white people because they had the first uh, eight seats, but more came on, and she refused. And the rest is history. But because her minister was actually Martin Luther King. And... Uh, those two events are separate, but they're linked together, and you can go sit in the bus uh, of uh, Rosa, Rosa, Rosa Parks. Okay, um, and the other one that'll give you chills is 
They have all the presidential limousines there. Uh, they have the one that shot Kennedy, which always gives me the goosebumps. They have the Reagan one. And if you go to the right of there, they have all these huge team trains. This is really too much to mention. Uh, you've got to come back. You're going to want to come back after and visit maybe Greenfield Village when you return. Remember, though, uh, I know it's late uh, because um, remember being 20 in the 70s was a lot easier than being 70 in the roaring 20s. We're in the new roaring 20s. It's time to go to bed. Thanks for listening. Have a nice evening.